Okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, so I thought we'd do that again. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 22 this time. Uh, everything about Abraham I find so uh, amazing and powerful. You know, the Bible says that he's our father in the faith and he's our example in the faith of being a man of faith. And so when you look at Abraham, you can learn what it is to be a real person of faith. And so when you read from chapters, Genesis chapters 12 through to Genesis chapter 22, like I said last week, I recommend you read through from Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis chapter 22. Anyone done that or not? Probably not. <laughs> I know what people are like. I know human nature. I'm well used to that. But I recommend again, I just suggest it to you again. Go from Genesis chapter 12 right through to Genesis chapter 22. Yeah. And just read through. It's interesting. It's not boring. And just read through about Abraham and just let God minister to you and speak to you in those chapters. And show you some things. Very interesting. By no means a perfect man. You know, he's lifted up very high. You know, the Jewish people think very highly of Abraham. And in Christian circles, we do as well. Like I say, he's the New Testament sees, he says he's our father in the faith. And so he's lifted up as, as a very high example in the Bible, but actually not by no, man's a, by no means a perfect person. Just like you and me, amen? Not totally imperfect. Got lots of faults, got lots of failings, make lots of mistakes. But God still loves us, and as we have faith, God responds to us. Amen. 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 There's one thing, I just, we'll just pray before we go any further, but Lord, please come and help us and make your word real to us and help me right now. Help every person here, Lord, for, for your word to be real and powerful. And come and just continue what you're already doing here in this place today, Lord. Just continue it and let it increase and be more and be more powerful even. Lord, as we progress, Lord, just through the rest of the service and throughout this day, Lord, let that anointing just rest on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's one thing that's really important. Um, I'm digressing a bit. We haven't even got into this yet. But one thing that's really important is to, is to never live under judgment, under other people's judgment. Amen. Never to live under other people's judgment. It's really important. You know, the Bible says, judge not that you not be judged. And the Bible also says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Thank God, mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is much more powerful than judgment. I remember when, uh, you know, David doesn't get here till a bit later uh, because he goes to Massey Church first and stuff and everything. But I remember, you know, when David had his crisis. I'm sure he wouldn't mind talking about it because he's quite open about it and his testimony and everything and stuff. But, you know, when David had his crisis towards the end of last year, you know, David had a real uh, alcohol problem and he came to a real crisis point and, uh, you know, he employed by Bill. And I remember he said that he went to Bill and he told Bill what was going on. And as I said, one of the things was, was that he was, you know, they operate machinery and vehicles and things like this. And he said to me, one of the things was that he was operating this stuff you know, intoxicated. So he was at work and he was drinking and he was operating, you know, driving trucks and so on or whatever it was, driving vehicles and things. And he was, I hope he did tell you this, Bill, because if he didn't, then... <laughs> but anyway, this is the way I remember the story and how he told it to me. And he said, and when he told me about what went on, he, <laughs> he said that, that Bill, you know, he said Bill could have sacked him. Right then at that point, he said, Bill could have sacked me if he wanted to. You know, he was with, well within his right. I mean, you operate, if you come to work drunk, it's immediate, you know. I, I can tell you that because when I was quite young, when I was about 19 years old, I got sacked for being on the job drunk. Yeah. So I know, I got reinstated two weeks later because they had very strong unions in that day. So I worked for Ford Motor Company of all places. But... Um, but yeah, I can tell you that being drunk on a job is definitely a sackable offence. And he said, oh, Bill could have sent me, but Bill didn't. And he said, oh, Bill's told me to go on a holiday, I think it was, or something, hey, for a couple of weeks. He'd go and have a break for a couple of weeks. And Bill said to him, just go and sort yourself out. Get yourself sorted. Get help and do the things you need to do to get yourself sorted. And David did. He went to get help and he went and found the things that would help him. And God really did something. Yeah. Hallelujah. You've seen the difference yeah. with David, the new David, to the old yeah. David. And, uh, but you know, the thing was, Bill had mercy. Yeah, amen. Amen. Mercy amen. triumphs over judgment. Amen. And I'm having to learn this more and more in my life. You know, there's many times where we want to judge people. But do you know what? We are never to live under the judgment of other people. 
And I personally make a choice that I never do. The Bible says that who is he, in Romans 8, who is he who condemns you? And it's basically saying there's no one that can because God has justified you. So you may not be perfect. You have all your failings, amen. You and me, we have all our failings, don't we? But we don't live under judgment because Jesus has set us free from judgment and condemnation. That was the whole purpose of Jesus, Jesus dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. So that we wouldn't be under that judgment. And so we mustn't judge others, amen. And we mustn't allow ourselves to come under judgment. Yes. Amen. 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 Yeah. Hallelujah. It's good to live a life that's free of judgment. Amen. Not being judged by other people and not judging other people. You know, if you judge other people very harshly, you will also feel like that about other people. If you judge people hard and you go, oh, this person like this and that person like this, and you're very critical and judgmental towards them, you will also feel that way about yourself. You will feel that others are judging you that way too. But if you don't judge others harshly and you're merciful, you will also experience mercy towards yourself. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. So I prefer mercy. And the Bible says, New Testament, you know, mercy triumphs over judgment. I just thought I'd put that in there. I just want to pray right now too, just before we get into this. Um, I just, uh, let's just, just, just bow our heads and just close our eyes and just pray. I just want to pray. I'm not doing an altar call right now or anything like that. But I just want to pray very specifically. I, you know, uh, I, I had a kind of a sort of a, like a kind of a mini vision uh, of someone and I felt like the Lord was saying to me that there was a person that he just wanted to minister to and it's just going to be between you know you and God maybe it's even more than one person but it's just going to be just between you and God right now we're just going to stop here and just pray and so you don't need to indicate who you are or anything like that it's just between you and God but I'll just pray from here and pray for you but I felt that uh, there would be at least one person anyway maybe more than one that, that, was, that would be here today who uh, that, you know, somewhere in your past that you've <laughs> suffered uh, a form of physical abuse. And uh, in, in the vision I saw that the person even still felt like, you know, it seemed like the marks of the abuse was still on them. And, uh, and I just felt the love of God reaching out to this person, and I feel the love of God right now reaching out. And so we just, we just all pray right now, and, and we, like I say, this is a private moment for, for any person that this refers to, but I just want to pray. And, and if that applies to you and you feel God speaking to you, just receive from the Lord right where you are right now. And Lord, we just pray, we just pray, we come by your love right now, Father, and just come and minister. And Lord, we know that you heal every wound, Lord, that your power is the only power that can completely heal every wound, Lord, especially from abuse from the past, Lord. And Lord, help that person or people, Lord, right now to just forgive, to completely forgive whoever was the perpetrator, Lord, and to let that go and to walk away from it and to put it into the past and to be completely free of it. And we pray you come with the blood of Jesus, Lord, and just wash it all away. Wash all the effects of it away. Wash the wounds away, Lord, and wash it even from the memory and, and just, Lord, wash the, every uh, damage from it away, Lord, in Jesus' name. Just come with your love. Lord, your tender, soothing love and just minister right now. And Lord, we just declare uh, that person or people completely free right now from the effects of that. Completely free from this moment onwards. We say in the name of Jesus that you are completely free. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, Genesis chapter 22, and it says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. You know, it says God tested Abraham. Well, you know, the Bible is very clear in the book of James. If you read James chapter 1, that God does not test or tempt anyone with evil. So God doesn't come and test us with evil things. Sometimes people, when they get sick, they say, oh, God's testing me. No. Sickness is just the result of the power of sin coming into the human race. And the devil comes and rides on that and capitulates on it. And I'm sure he's big news. And, and makes it worse. So, and you know, the Bible is very clear that sickness is really very much from the devil. The, the point I'm trying to make is, it's not from God. Amen. So God doesn't come and test us like that with things like that. 
Amen? Amen. These things happen, but they're not from God. God does not, God can't send sickness on you because God doesn't have any sickness to send. Do you understand? Amen. There's no sickness in heaven, the book of Revelation says. Yes. There's no pain, there's no sickness, there's no tears in heaven. So God doesn't have any sickness even to give us. That comes from the enemy. Amen. And so we have to rebuke it. We have to stand against it. We have to believe God for healing. God's our healer. The Bible says in Exodus 15, 26, that I am the Lord, he says, that heals you. Hallelujah. Not the Lord who gives you diseases, but the Lord who heals you. Amen. It's really important to be clear about that point. Because sometimes people are sick and they think, oh, God's testing me, or this sickness is somehow for God's glory and things. No, healing is for God's glory. Amen. When people get healed, it gives God's glory. Being sick doesn't give anyone much glory except the devil. Amen. Amen. <laughs> anyway, so God is good. The devil is bad. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Anyway, it says God tested Abraham. So there are tests. Though. Sometimes in life there are tests that come. And sometimes God's observing us and, and looking and saying, well, what are they going to do? You know, some challenge comes in our life. Something comes along. And the Lord looks and he says, well, what are they going to do with this trial or test that's in their life? And uh, God, it says that God tested Abraham and he said to him, he called out to him, he said, Abraham. It's like if God comes to me and says, Branch. What did Abraham do? He said, here I am. Straight away. Here I am. Do you know that many times we are hard of hearing? Yeah. <laughs> God says, Branch. God says, God comes along, Bread. In a very subtle, still small voice. And Brett's like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> going through life, didn't even hear it. Yeah. So then a bit later, Brett, <laughs> Brett's still like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> and then, is that good? Then? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then a little later, Brett, <laughs> and he's like, oh, oh my goodness, God is speaking to me. We can be hard of hearing, amen. Abraham was not hard of hearing. Abraham was sensitive to God's voice. And so we need to be sensitive to when God's speaking to us. Sometimes He'll speak to you directly. Sometimes He'll speak to you through some kind of sign like you, you were just talking about. Sometimes God will speak to you from His Word through the Bible, many times through the Bible. You know, uh, God will speak, you know, right in your inner being and speak to you. God will speak to you through someone else speaking to you, for a preacher, just like me talking now, or for a friend or something coming to you and telling you something. And God could be speaking to you. And in many ways to speak, could speak to you in a dream and so on, all the different ways God speaks. But we can be hard of hearing. Amen? Sometimes we're not hearing. You know, somebody, somebody comes to someone and says, hey, come to church with me. And it's actually God reaching out to that person. But the person's like, oh, no, I, you know, I've got um, sports on Sunday. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about this this morning. Does anyone remember uh, 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 Michael Jones? You know, a Samoan guy who was an all black. Mm, yeah. uh, and, you know, probably one of the most famous all blacks of all time. Mm. And you know what he did? You, those people who remember him, because this is a little while ago, it was the first all blacks team that won the World Cup. And it took him a very long time to win it back after that time. Uh, an amazing team, actually. You know, John Kerwin, uh, the guy who comes on the TV about Christian and stuff, he was on the wing and so on. There's amazing players in that team, and amazing people even in that team. But there was one thing Michael Jones did. He said, uh, and this is even in the Rugby World Cup, he did this. It's unimaginable today. But back then, he said, and I think this is probably about 1990 or thereabouts, late 80s or early 90s, and he said to uh, the people that were all running it, he said, I, I will not play on Sundays. He was one of their most valued players. And he said to them, I won't play on Sundays. He said, I've been brought up as a Christian, and on, and on Sunday in our family, that day is set apart to worship God, to go to church, and to rest, and so on. And, uh, and he said, so I will not play on Sundays. And you know, uh, I tell you something, that man earned huge respect. He had huge respect for, from people about it. No one ever disrespected him about his uh, policy that he would not play on Sundays. He had huge respect from many unbelievers. 
Now you imagine if he just compromised. You imagine if he just said, oh, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm an all-black, you know, I've got to play whenever they tell me to play. I mean, there would have been no, you know, there would have been no extra respect whatsoever. Because people would have just looked and said, oh, well, you know, he's a Christian, but he's not worried about it. And that's, so he's just going to play. You know, it's more important to him to play as an all-black than, than, than God is in his life. But because he made a stand and said God is more important and put God first, he had huge respect from many people who weren't even Christians. I mean, he had respect from Christians too, but he had huge respect from many who weren't even Christians and who maybe never even became Christians, but he had the respect. Amen. Hallelujah. So sometimes, you know, we're hard to hear about these things. Somebody says, you, you know, somebody comes to us and says something and God's trying to reach it, or even the preacher is talking. You know, sometimes when I'm preaching, I'm very conscious sometimes that God is speaking to me. And then I watch and wait over the coming weeks. You know, I'm sorry about this. I haven't got x-ray eyes or anything like that, so don't worry. But, you know, I don't see into people's souls or anything like that. No one can do that. But, you know, so don't worry. But I'll tell you this. I, I do observe people. And so I'll sense God speaking to people and things like that. And then I wait over the coming weeks and I think, it's going to be interesting to see how this person responds to what God was saying to them. And so I watch and observe in people's lives and see if there's a response and see if something happens in their heart. And many times it does and other times it doesn't. You know, it just varies according to the person and the situation. But what I want to put to you is, don't be hard of hearing, amen? When God begins to speak into your life and move in your life and He says something to you, don't be hard of hearing. Just be just like Abraham and say, here I am. Here I am. If He speaks, oh, Brent. Yeah, here I am. I'm right here, Lord. Here I am. It's not going to hurt you, I think. God's got your best interests at heart. You know, the, the most blessed and most greatest place to be in life is to be in the perfect will of God. Is to find the perfect will of God for your life. And that is the most blessed, protected place you can ever be in. Amen. So to just say, here I am, and to say, God, I'll obey you. I had a moment one time, decades ago, you know, more than 20 years ago. And I went into, we used to have this little caravan outside the house where we stayed, where I used to go and pray and speak time with God. And I went out into this little old caravan, and I said to the Lord one day, I said, Lord, you know what, Lord? I will do whatever you want me to do for the rest of my life. One day, it's about 20-something years ago. I was already a Christian, but I just felt the Lord wanted me to just hand over my life completely to Him. And so I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do in my life, from here on in, I'll do it. And this is like with Abraham right here. Abraham just says, here I am. Whatever you want to do, Lord, I'll do it. Amen? Amen. You know, imagine if the Lord said to me, Yes, Brett, uh, I, I now call you to go and clean and scrub toilets for the next 30 years. Imagine if the Lord said that. Well, you know what you should do if God said that? You go and clean and scrub the toilets. <laughs> Amen? Amen? You know, sometimes people feel that the calling of God will be so glamorous. I can tell you, I don't think the calling of God is very glamorous. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, but I don't think it's gla ever glamorous, particularly. Amen? Amen? It's just, God calls you, and you obey God, and you do what God calls you to do, and then He protects you, and He blesses you. And it is the most wonderful life, but I don't think it's always glamorous. Amen? You know, when those people are in the kitchen there, like Jamie and stuff, and they're making cups of tea for people and stuff like that, and serving God like that, Probably not very glamorous. Maybe. <laughs> but it's a way to serve God, isn't it? And to serve people. Hallelujah! Amen. So whatever God calls you to do, just do it. Anyway, God said to him, verse 2, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I still can't conceive of this. I still can't quite get to grips with this verse. That God says to him, take your only son and go and offer him a sacrifice. I can't. I've read it and I've read it and I've read it and I've talked to the Lord about it and all sorts. And I still can't completely come to grips with it. Is that okay? I'm sorry. I don't know how you go with it. But I, I find it amazing first. The, the incredible thing is that he never ever has to do it. God tells him to do it. But God's plan is he will never have to do it. But Abraham says, God, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. Whatever you tell me to do, I'll do it. It doesn't matter what it is. If you tell me to stay here, I'll stay here. If you tell me to go here, I'll go here. Amen? Amen. 
obedient. Yeah, obedience. You know, if you tell me to say this, I'll say this. If you tell me to be quiet, I'll be quiet. Mm. Amen. We're always ready to say something sometimes, but sometimes the Lord says, be quiet. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Much harder sometimes to be quiet, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> you know, some relative or something in your family is attacking you. It's like totally just coming against you and abusing you or something and calling you everything under the sun. And the Lord says, be quiet. <laughs> he might not say that, but what if he does? Amen. Hallelujah. Whatever he says, do it. And this is what Abraham's like. So Abraham rose early in the morning, verse 3, and sat his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he took all the things they needed. And then they travel, and then they get to, well, where should we go to? We'll go to um, uh, verse 7. It says, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, I am my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So Isaac saw that they had all the preparations for the sacrifice, but uh, they didn't. Uh, have the actual lamb for the sacrifice. You know, in the Old Testament, they sacrificed animals, amen, and they didn't have one. Uh, and by the way, the place they were going to was a place called Mount Moriah, and Mount Moriah ended up being where they built the Jewish temple. That's just interesting, isn't it? Anyway, uh, it says, Abraham says in verse 8, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. That's Abraham's faith talking. Amen. God will provide it. Hallelujah. If you read over in the book of Hebrews, I've said this before when we read this, but it's worth saying again. If you read over in the book of Hebrews in verse 11, it says that Abraham uh, believed that even if his son was sacrificed, God would raise him from the dead. That's where his faith was. He wasn't worried about anything. He just obeyed God and trusting that God would provide. Amen. You have to trust that God will provide. Amen. You've got to do it. You know, I have times sometimes where I look at my finances and I see something coming up or something's going on with our finances and I and I go, Lord. <laughs> but you know, God always comes through. God always comes through. I've learned it after years and years and years. God always comes through. So I don't worry about it anymore. Sometimes I look at the Lord and I just look up a bit and go, <laughs> um, <laughs> but He comes through. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Amazingly. In amazing ways, in miraculous ways. And uh, it says, They came to the place where God had told him, and he built the altar, and he placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. This is unreal, if you really think about it. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Now, I used to read this and think, almost picture Abraham like this, you know, like the horror movies. <laughs> you know, like this with a knife up in the air like this. But actually it says... He, he, he stretched out his hand and he took the knife. So he got him that far. Okay? He was I don't believe he was to the point where he was standing over his son like this. But he got to the point where he prepared everything. You know, I don't think you'd be doing this too fast. Amen? <laughs> you'd be waiting for God to do something and intervene, wouldn't you? So I think, you know, he did that part. And then he's going to the knife. And it, and it says, he's picked up the knife. And then at that point... It says, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad, on the child, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. See, Abraham wouldn't withhold anything from God. And this is huge. This is another thing I've learned about God is not to withhold anything from him. You know, uh, for me personally, this is what I believe, and and I can assure you that it's paid off in my life over the last 25 years, is, you know, Malachi 3 says that a tenth of my income belongs to God. Yeah. And so for 20-something years, I haven't touched it. It's always gone to God. Mm. You remember that Jesus said, you know, give to God what is God's and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And so what is God's, I've always given to Him. I've never withheld it. And so I look at it and I say, that's God's. It's not even mine. It's not even mine to touch. So before I do any of it, you know, most families, there's one person who has to do all the 
budget and all the pay the bills, isn't there usually? And in our family, it's me, you know, me makes blissfully unaware. You know, she's just like, as long as there's money in the account, and I can go shopping. And uh, so it's all good. As long as it's like that, everyone's happy and everyone's at peace. Yeah, she works. Yes, thank you, love, for reminding us. And uh, <laughs> apparently, I don't. I just, I'm just sitting around in a deck chair all day. But anyway, <laughs> don't worry. When you've been married as long as us, you understand all these things. And uh, I can now. I completely can't remember what I was talking about. Uh, yeah, not touching what belongs to God. When I go to do all those books, because I'm the one that does that job, the first thing that happens is I go into the internet banking and the tithe, the tenth of our income is transferred over to the church before I touch anything else. And so when I go to look at my finances, whatever is left after that is what we work with. Because I just say, the other's God's. Give to God what is God's. I'm not going to touch it. It's God's. Amen? I mean, when I come to your house and come and go into your drawers and go, I go to Jane and Bill's house and go, oh, you know, Jane and Bill might have a bit of cash. I want a bit of, you know, I want to go to the shops. And go through their drawers and go, oh, here's some money of Jane and Bill's and put it in my pocket. And what would that be? It'd be stealing. It's theirs. I think. And so the same with God's tent. I don't touch it. Now, I don't, we don't say to people at church, come to church and fill out a contract or something that you're going to get. We don't do that kind of thing and we don't put pressure on people and we just leave it to people's own freedom and we just love people whether they do it or not. I don't go in looking at the, you know, the, the records get sent to me as a backup or whatever and stuff of what, you know, the records of the church me, but I hardly even look at them. Uh, I don't go in there and say, oh, right, now who's tithing and who's not and all sort of thing. I don't even worry about that kind of stuff. I just leave it to people's own conscience and for them to let God speak to them. Maybe. But I'm telling you what happens in my life. Amen? Because I know it's real. So I just tell people, this is how it works for me. This is what I've been doing for 20-something years. And, you know... Uh, and, and this is where I'm at. And if you could see, you know, my finances and the things God does and the things that happen in my life, I haven't got time to tell you all of it. Even in the last two weeks, I could tell you about some amazing things. But if you could see the things that happen, you would understand that it brings you into the place of the supernatural. And people say, how do I do it? It's a huge sacrifice. Well, Abraham just did it. When we first did it, we just ate soup all week sometimes. Because it seemed like we couldn't afford to do it, but we just did it anyway. And anyway, I'm not going to try. I want to put pressure on you because I'm just I'm putting it out there. But it says, you have not withheld. Now, this doesn't apply to just things like money and finances. This applies to everything. It applies to our time. Amen. Will we give some time for God? You know, and it, withhold, it, it, it even refers to just us, our presence. Amen. You know, when you came to church today, you gave your presence. Amen to the church, you being here for this time, amen? For God to enjoy, for you to worship God and fellowship with God and for other people to enjoy, amen? So the other believers can fellowship with you. So you came here, just you coming here was you not withholding because you didn't withhold your presence, your attendance, amen, from church. You came here and offered yourself, amen? amen. It's all part of not withholding. Hallelujah. You know, when you come and express yourself, when you speak, amen, you know, you came and first time we even met you, amen, and you come up and you tell about something amazing that God did in your life, you know, that's called not withholding. Amen. You know, we speak out and we, and we actually release and we act on what God's stirring up in our heart. You know, years ago, some of you will have heard this before, I'm sure Monica will have. You know, Monica probably has to listen to, she's probably listened to some of my anecdotes about 20 times over the years, but somehow, patiently, she endures, amen. But, you know, when Nime and I were, uh, and some of you, you others too will have heard some of them many times, but, uh, oh, my beautiful granddaughter. So when I look at her, everything, my whole mind just goes, and everything, and all the thoughts go out of my head, and all I can just see is how beautiful she is. Uh, so that's probably the end of the preaching. I think I've lost it now. Uh, where were we? When I look at this baby, I just, honestly, I just go gaga. I just, honestly, I just lose the plot. She's just so beautiful. I, I'm amazed that those two can produce such a beautiful baby. I just shouldn't say that. Really. That does sound very respectful. But you created a beautiful baby and God created a beautiful baby. So where were we? Oh, that's right. When Nime and I were youth pastoring, and Nime was a youth pastor. She was a poor and I, oh no. And uh, and and Nime was a paid worker in those days and paid for ministry. And uh, 
And we just pray for Isaac, Lord, just help him and bless him in Jesus' name. And, and I used to help her with being a youth pastor. She was also the music director in the church we're in, and I used to help her with her. She was the employee and I was the helper in those days. And one thing I learned, we used to watch these people in youth group, they were mainly teenagers, there was a young adults group as well, but particularly with, well actually with both groups I noticed that come to think of it. And we used to watch them when they came together for social things. Like, you know, next Saturday there's a sort of a, there's a youth group, you know, for a couple of hours. Uh, I really recommend this. This uh, I'm allowed to go, even though I'm 51, I'm allowed to go. Hallelujah. Somehow I get to be allowed to, I don't know when I'll be banned, but I haven't been banned so far, even though my behaviour is probably not all that good. Uh, but, you know, we used to have things like this back then too. And uh, especially in social settings, like we used to have a kind of a outing or I used to watch some young people, and I said to Nimei one time, I said, some of these young people are really shy. You know, we had some seemingly quite shy people in the youth group. And I remember her talking to her about it. I said, you know, um, if you watch some of these young people, some of them are really shy. You know, you put them in a social environment. Have you watch that thing where everybody just goes somewhere so that they can just, you know, they go somewhere social, but then as soon as they get there, it's like, walk into the room, everyone's there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this, you know, suddenly my phone becomes really, really interesting. <laughs> and so you'd be in these environments and they'd be on their phones and they weren't communicating and talking with each other. Have you heard that nowadays when you go to a restaurant or an outing or you go to McDonald's or whatever, you know what you're meant to do? You're meant to have a phone stack. You get your phones and you put them all in a stack in the middle of the table and you don't touch them so that people don't go on their phone. Amen? Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. And um, anyway, we'd see them doing these sort of things and not some of them, some of them were fine. Some of them were totally the opposite of shy, like they'd just be crazy. You know, some of them were pretty much mental, I think. And I used to enjoy the mental ones. I thought they were great. You know, I better be given my terminology. I'm probably not being very PC. But anyway, uh, you know, but some of them were really shy. And then, so I was observing them over a time and I was trying to help them kind of come out of themselves a bit, you know, and sort of just relate to people a bit more and things like that. And then, you know, I began to realise something as I got to know some of these who I thought were shy kids. And I found out actually some of them were not shy. That I would talk to them and they were in no way shy. But actually what they were doing was they were withholding themselves from other people. So they would come into the social situation, but they wouldn't offer of themselves. So they would stand back and they would say, I don't want to share myself with the other people who are here in this room. And it was sad. So we used to have to try and encourage them to, hey, come out of yourself and don't be so selfish. You've got something to offer to people. Your personality, you know, your sense of humour, your whatever it is, even your odd things and strange things, amen, just release it all and let people enjoy it. Amen. I mean, we're all a bit weird in one way or another, amen? So you may as well just release that and be that and have fun and enjoy it and have a laugh, amen? amen. Hallelujah. And so we used to have to try and encourage people to do that. But that's what I learned. I realized after a while they weren't even shy. They were withholding themselves. So don't withhold yourself, amen, from other people. Offer yourself out there. Put yourself out there and have fun and just... Be open with people, amen, and be vulnerable. And don't worry, if somebody hurts you or says something bad to you or something like that, don't worry, be okay, amen. amen. The Lord will heal you. <laughs> amen. 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 Hallelujah, we're nearly there. It says, Then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Another story that I've told many times, uh, that Monica's probably heard at least 15 times, was I came out of the warehouse one day, and I remember I was just like this, uh, it says that in this case there was a, a ram um, caught in a bush that Abraham saw. I walked out of the warehouse one day and there was $50 caught in a bush. The wind had blown and he'd blown this $50 note into a bush. And so I was walking out of the warehouse and I thought, that's a $50 note. It's like, <laughs> like this. And uh, no, it wasn't fine. There was no one around. It wasn't like it had just flown out of someone's pocket. It had just been sitting there waiting for me. The God's like that. Amen. <laughs> It says a ram caught in a thicket, a ram caught in a bush, like this, this ram's caught there and it can't get out. Well, God will do that kind of thing for you, amen? Yeah. You look around, you know, if you're struggling in the area of your finances or in the area of God providing for you somehow in your life, or even in any area of your life, your relationship, your health, whatever it is, look for a ram that's caught in the thicket, amen? Look for where God has, has done something to provide for you, because there'll be something. 
Even when it seems hopeless, look up, look to God and pray and say, Lord, you know what situation I'm in. You know what's going on in my life. You know the struggle. And then look around for what God will do. Amen. Because God's going to do something. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 There will be a ram caught in the thicket somewhere for you. Hallelujah. And some people give up. They, they look around. Oh, it's not there immediately. Amen. Just keep looking around. Hallelujah. Somewhere there's going to be a ram caught in the thicket for you. Amen. In the bush. Where the thicket's quite an old English word. It says, So Abraham uh, went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place. The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. You know, Abraham would have never found this provision unless he'd listened to God, he'd heard from God, he'd acted on what God said, and gone up to this mountain and did exactly what God said, and he hadn't withheld, I mean, he never withheld any from God. Then he found out what this was all about. That the Lord will provide. Actually, in the Old Testament, that those words the Lord will provide is actually one of the names of God. In an English uh, rendition of it, you can say uh, Jehovah Jireh, which is the Lord who provides. Amen. It's actually one of the names of God in the Old Testament. The Lord who provides. Hallelujah. So he found out one of the names, one of the aspects of God that God would provide. But how did he find out? He had to completely obey. He didn't withhold anything. That's the place that this man came to. And then he found God on this mountain. Amen. And he found out what God's supernatural provision is like. Whether it's a $50 note stuck in the bushes, whether it's somebody comes and gives you something, whether it's you receive something in the mail, whether it's whatever it is. Amen? Uh, years ago, you know, I, I got a huge check from it in their revenue. I didn't know where it was from. I didn't know what it was. And I asked them and they just said, you own it. And they said, and I said, well, are you sure? I don't want to be owing to you or anything. And they said, no, it's yours. And I didn't know where it was from. It wasn't from my rebate, from my giving or anything like that. It was just an out of the blue thing that came in the mail one day. And to this day, I don't know why I got it. But it's about 10 years ago or something. But I'm, I just, I asked them and they said, well, sure. I thought, okay. Mm -hmm. Totally out of the blue. That's the kind of thing God will do. Hallelujah! I could tell you a lot more things, but I don't want to do it because it just I'll go on and on. But he said the, it's the name of the place, the Lord will provide, and in the mount of the Lord provide. You know, you need to find that mountain with God. Amen. Your mountain. You need to find your mountain place. You know, where's your mountain place? Where is the place where you're going to really meet with God? One thing is it should be here. In the worship time and the preaching and everything else that goes on here, the fellowship and so on, this is definitely one place that should be like a mountain of God, amen? That we go up the mountain and we meet with God in that place. Also in your own prayer life, amen? Maybe it's when you go for a walk down to the park or something like that. <laughs> you drive to Parkery Beach, amen? That's a beautiful beach. You know, and you, and you have this mountain place experience with God. You've got to find these mountain place experiences with God. And you, if you seek for them, you'll find them. Amen? God's waiting there. He's just waiting. He's saying, come and just fellowship with me. He's just waiting for you to come and fellowship with Him. You know, somewhere, somehow in your life, you've got to find these mountaintop places. Amen? Find this way to get with God and have this encounter with God because it changes everything. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You know, it takes you out of the place of the struggle where you're struggling and struggling and you've got this big giant Goliath in front of you thinking, how am I going to deal with this big Goliath? And then next thing you know, like this, and you've hit the Goliath in the head with a stone and he's dead. Amen? And instead of seeing how big the Goliath is, you're seeing how big God is. Hallelujah! That's usually what happens when you get with God. God begins to show you things from where He sees it. He's big and He's powerful and He can do anything. And you begin to see it from His point of view. Instead of before, you were seeing it from your point of view. And you see it from the point of view of your struggle. And you're struggling and you feel like you're so small against this big challenge. But then God gets a hold of you and He begins to do something on the inside of you. And you see how big and powerful He is. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And then God begins to speak to Abraham and, and make a promise to him. And, and he says, 
He says, I'll bless you. I'll multiply you as the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore. Did anyone go away during the week from last week and go and look at the night sky for a while? Like I suggested, not even one. <laughs> you people are such disobedient people. <laughs> anyway, I suggest to you, go and spend some time looking at a night sky, just like what God told I know there's mosquitoes and stuff, but just take the fly spray or something. And look at the night sky for a while and just let God minister to you, amen. You can have a mountaintop experience just like that, just like the rainbow clouds, amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so God was showing him the stars of the sky and the sand on the seashore. And he said, your descendants will be like this and they'll possess the gates of the enemy. So God gives him this great promise. But listen, to get to that promise, there's a journey, amen. To get to the promise, there's a journey. And on that journey, you've got to patiently endure. Amen. And you've got to obey God. And you can't withhold anything from God. Amen. That's my recommendation to you from the Word of God today. You know, obey God. Do what God says. Amen. When He speaks to you. Don't try and do your own thing. You know, if you do your own thing, you end up on your own. Amen. You're out there and God still loves you and everything. But what can He do with you? Because you're doing your own thing instead of His thing. Amen. But when you do God's thing, He's totally in that. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so you'll experience His power. And so there's a journey to this. So And there's not withholding. And, then you can, and there's these mountain place experiences with God. And then you can come to the place of this promise. Amen. Of promises of God being fulfilled in your life. Hallelujah. God will speak things to your life, specific promises. God spoke to me something specific recently. He told me, it's just for me and Nime and no one else. And it's the most beautiful promise. And I got so excited. It was just a verse I read in the Bible. I'd never even seen this verse before. I mean, I guess I'd read it, but it had never jumped out before. And God said to me, this is not for you to preach. This is not for you to give to anyone else. It's not for anyone else, but just you and Nime. And I said, okay. Actually, I was really happy about that. Because most things God speaks to me, I just preach it out and share it. But I felt like God was saying to me, hey, this is just something between me and you guys. But God will do that for you too, amen. He'll speak things specifically to your life to help you and to help you overcome and to get victory in your life. Amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. I think we'll just, uh, Louise, 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 just come and play the piano. I think we'll have another altar call. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that good fun to have altar calls? I like having altar calls. Thank you, Jesus. Not many people said, I mean, I don't care. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It is a good thing to have articles because when you speak the Word of God and you preach out the Word of God, it gives people a chance to respond. Amen. And sometimes people need to be able to have that opportunity to really respond to God and say, yes, Lord, I really want to respond to you. And so I just want to give that opportunity today. Now, just let's just be quiet before the Lord and just be seated before the Lord and just be open to Him. And I just want you to just forget. Can you, can you just, as you're listening to me now, just forget about me even and forget about everyone else here in this room. But let's just see what the Lord's doing with you right now. Amen. And what the Holy Spirit's doing and, and how He's reaching out to you right now. Forget about everyone else. Just you and God. Amen. Just you and God. Just in this moment, just let it be you and God. Forget about everything else. Forget about everyone else. You know, the Lord has these moments and these times. This is like one of those mountaintop experiences like what Abraham had. You know, these times that God sets aside just for it to be you and Him and for you to have an encounter with Him. And I believe this morning that there's some people in this room that the Lord's doing that right now. He's reaching out to you and he, He's offering an encounter with, with Him, a mountain top encounter with Him. Hallelujah. And as I've been preaching this morning and speaking and preaching from the Word of God, you know, the Lord's been stirring you in your spirit and you felt in your spirit that you're reaching out to God and you, you sense God speaking to you and reaching out to you and ministering to you. And so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to ask... Uh, for those people who are feeling like that right now, just come here to the front and we're just going to pray for you and just let you have that moment with God. And don't be self-conscious or anything like that. Don't be embarrassed. Don't forget about everyone else, but just come and have that time with God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Tina. Just anyone?
anyone else right now, I just want to just come and have that time. If you sense that, you know, Tina obviously senses that God's reaching out to her. I just want anyone else here that you really sense His reaching Just take a moment right now and just say to yourself, you know, is God really reaching out to me right now in my spirit? Is, do you feel that pull from the Holy Spirit and Him just calling you? If you do, just come up here right now and we'll pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I just get money to come and pray with me as well. Come and help me pray. Thank you, Jesus. I just lay hands on you and pray for you, Lord. Thank you so much. saying that, you know, even like that, that the Lord's saying, just keep uh, relating to Him and talking to Him, just as you did even when you were a child, because, you know, the, the Bible says that uh, unless you become like a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord looks and sees that that little child, that little girl who just related to Him and, 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 and was aware of God, and He sees that in your heart, you know, your heart responding to Him. And I believe the Lord is really pleased, really so pleased and so happy and, and so enjoying the response of your heart to Him, that your heart is responding to Him, hallelujah, and that even today you've responded to Him, that you've heard His voice, that you, you've known that the Lord's been calling out, calling out to you. And you're responding, and the Lord is really meeting you. It's like the parable of the prodigal son, you know, where the father sees the son coming, and the father runs to the son, and it's like the father is running to you and embracing you with all his love. Hallelujah. He loves you so much. Loves you so much. He's your heavenly dad, your heavenly father. And Jesus loves you so much. And the Holy Spirit is just coming and wrapping you and embracing you and enclosing and clothing you with His love. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 I see the calling of God on your life to Him to serve Him. I really see that the Lord is calling you, calling you to serve Him, to be a servant of God, even to serve in the house of God. I believe the Lord is really saying that, you know, you have gifts and talents and the Lord's calling you and, and saying, come and offer those gifts and talents to Him and be used by God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. really doing something, isn't he? Amen? Come pray for you, Jenny, come. You know, Jenny, trying to, she thinks she's a race car driver, she's trying to crash cars and things. Come, Jenny, come up here. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray for Jenny. Are you happy that Jenny, have anyone seen pictures of Jenny's car? Yeah. She's trying to be a race car driver and she smashed up her car and, uh, hey, Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, so we're very happy that Jenny's alive, actually. Amen? Very happy that Jenny's alive. Because she smashed up her car during the week. And uh, thankfully, she's okay. Amen? The car's probably not so okay. The car's wrecked. 
but uh, but Jenny's okay. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I just want to pray for her, Lord. We just thank you for preserving this woman of God. You know, these two just got baptized quite recently. And Lord, we just rebuke the enemy and we say you have no hold on Ringo and Jenny's life. And we just pray the blood of Jesus around them and over this woman of God and total protection over her. We thank you for preserving her and keeping her safe, Lord. And devil, we say you will not we rebuke you, devil. And we say, how dare you? And we say, you will not do anything like this to a woman of God who is the property of God and belongs to Jesus. Hallelujah. We ask you, Lord, to bless her. Lord, come and replace the car. Come and provide for her and provide for every need, Lord. And come and make things even better than before. In Jesus' name, Lord, turn it around. Lord, what the enemy meant for evil, we pray you turn it for good and make it even better, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Let's just pray for Ringo. Oh, he's doing things with the finger. Let's just pray for me. Pray. Lord, we thank you for the talents and gifts in this man. Lord, we just release an even greater measure of your anointing to this man, Lord, for playing the drums and ministering and music, Lord. Hallelujah. And all the other gifts and talents that are in his life, Lord. We just pray a release of them, that they will be released, Lord. Lord, for the benefit of the body of Christ, for the benefit of the church, and for the benefit of people all around, everywhere, Lord, that his giftings and talents will be released in a greater way, in a greater measure, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I just prophesy to Colette right now, even where she is. You know, Colette's a youth and young adults leader for anyone who doesn't know. But I just going to prophesy to you, Colette, uh, right now, just even where you're sitting. And I just prophesy the miraculous to your life, that the supernatural is coming, that the Lord is coming to do some supernatural stuff and to move in your life. And you're going to see some things that you haven't seen before. Hallelujah. There's some breakthroughs coming. The Lord's going to break through from the heavenly realm, from the spiritual realm, into the natural, into the physical world. And you will see some things breaking and come into your life that are powerful blessings and a powerful move of the supernatural. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord says even things that seem like they're sleeping, even things in your life that seem like they even died, that the Lord's saying, I'm coming to resurrect them. I'm coming to awaken things. I'm coming to stir things up, says the Lord. I'm coming to move in a greater measure in your life, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just give praise to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen, everyone. Have a nice cup of coffee and things.